How you doing today, guys? It's your boy, Rogi the Beast, and I am back with another reaction video. And, uh, yeah, I'm about to get into, uh, <laughs> some, uh, Gully Boy. If y'all don't know about Gully Boy, bro, that's, I don't know, bro. Y'all missing something. You gotta check him out at least once. I'm saying, though, the man, he cold. So go check him out, man. Also, don't forget to hit that like, share, and subscribe. And also, down in the description below, I will have his link up to his video. Go check that out. Alright? Or go check out more of his videos. You know what I'm saying? I'm only watching one. There's plenty of them. If y'all want to see me watch them again, you know what I'm saying? Y'all know what to do. Here we go. Now, I'm going to break it down and tell a story about a nigga in the wrong territory. Shining and shining is who he had to meet. Now we discuss the diss track with the Dr. Dre and Easy e War that many believe crushed Dr. Dre's diss track. Just in case if you guys haven't seen Popular Diss Tracks Part 3, let me give you a quick summary on what led up to this notable diss track. In 1991, there would be tension within the group NWA. With one of their main pieces gone, the group tried their best to remain in the forefront and they most certainly did as their second album, Niggas for Life, would do very well on the charts. But even though they were seeing success with the second album, problems would arise when Dr. Dre realized that he wasn't getting paid what he should have been as he produced the majority of N.W.A.'s tracks. This caused Dr. Dre to leave the group and also cut ties with Easy es record label Ruthless Records. But another issue Dre faced was that he was still under contract with Ruthless as he started his own record label with longtime security guard Suge Knight called Death Row Records. Suge Knight and his crew allegedly stormed into Ruthless Records with baseball bats demanding Easy e to release Dr. Dre from his label. Rather this incident happened or not, Dr. Dre was still very much under Easy es contract, and when Dr. Dre released his diss track, Messing With Dre Day, along with his debut album, The Chronic, Easy e would receive 25 cent for every copy it sold. With all the W's Easy e was catching, he would then respond to Dr. Dre's diss track in 1993, along with releasing his second EP, its own Dr. Dre 187 Killer. The EP was full of disses towards Dr. Dre and Death Row Records. The original single from this EP was supposed to be a diss track aimed at Dr. Dre called Its Own, but one of Easy es associates got word of an inspiring rapper that was making his name be known throughout the streets of Compton. Gangsta Dreysta would get released out of youth incarceration just in time to get a call from a Ruthless Records associate to meet Easy e When Dreysta arrived at the studio, him and Easy bonded quickly. Easy started airing out all of Dr. Dre's dirty laundry, which made it very easy for Dreysta to come up with the concept of the song and also write the lyrics for himself and Easy e The very next day, Dreysta would bring his younger brother BG Knockout to the studio, in which he freestyled his verse in front of Easy e right on the spot. Impressed by both Dreysta and BG Knockout's skill and talent, Easy e would celebrate with the brothers as he knew he had a banger on his hands. When the music video was released, the track would reach great heights to eventually becoming Easy es highest charting single. The track itself opens up with an intimidating instrumental followed up with death blow lyrics by each artist. Easy e starts on the first verse by Blake. Alright, so I'm just going to say this about this video right now. I mean, I'm not, I'm not fuck with the video at all. I'm just trying to say this right now. Dude. So when they... I, I, would, I, would, I would say I'm kind of a, a, a person that's into the whole rap beef and stuff. Because I just like when two MCs just go at it. When they, when they, when they use their lyrics to go at another opponent. You know what I'm saying? To me, that shit dope. As dope. But it, I don't know. Some people don't like it. And that's cool. That ain't your flavor. But guess what? I like it. I don't care. <laughs> so, I don't know. Like, I'm, I'm a fan of, like, rap disses. Especially if they're cold. If they're whack, I ain't trying to listen to it. Y'all already know what it is. I'm first part disrespecting Dr. Dre and Death Row Records. He also ends the first verse with one of the most famous lines in the track. Damn me, they tried to fade you on Dre Day. But Dre Day only met Easy Day. Then 
Dre comes on the second verse and talks about how Dr. Dre isn't a real gangster as he never broke the law. He says that Dr. Dre is an actor that portrays like he's tough, which is the definition of the term studio gangster that was heavily used during the 90s. Then BG Knockout comes on the third verse with one of my all time favorite opening verses. Well, it's the knockout definition of original baby gangster. I punch me like you. Then Knockout reiterates on his big brother's points and lets it be known that they're the real gangsters as they both rep the neighborhood crips. Knockout also informs us that Dre isn't even really from Compton. Then Easy E comes on the final verse and just goes all out on Dr. Dre. He talks about the situation with D Borns in which Dre assaulted her. He goes on about how Dre was never a gangster as he wore makeup and lipstick when he was a part of the world class wrecking crew. He then talks about how Dr. Dre's situation at Death Row Records isn't all that sweet as Suge Knight runs his organization like a boot camp with Dr. Dre and the rest of the artists following all his orders. Get out. <laughs> and at death row, I hear you getting treated like boot camp. Gotta follow your sergeant's directions or get your ass this diss track is most certainly a certified classic, and I'm on that side that believe it's a better diss track than messing with Dre Day. After this diss track was released, you really didn't hear any more disses from Dr. Dre, but there were diss tracks from other Death Row artists. These boots is fools in a pound in one room. Assume it's only for conversation, so let's wow, conversate. Wow, Slip a nigga to 38. Easy E would go on to diss Dr. Dre and Death Row, mainly because it drew in more publicity, which drew in more revenue. Those who knew Easy E oftentimes said that his beef with Dr. Dre was wasn't serious on a personal level, but it was mandatory that he used the situation to draw in more attention to himself and his label. It was rumored that Easy E and Dr. Dre were on the verge of stopping the beef, but it would be too late as Easy E passed away in 1995. Easy E's death was a huge loss for hip hop as he achieved many great things in his career. He managed a successful rap label and he put a lot of people in great places. I could go down the list of names, but I don't want to make this segment too long. Dr. Dre also shared his sentiment towards Easy's passing by saying that even even though they had beef, him and Easy were still close friends, and it was just a falling out that brothers have. Eventually, they would have reunited. With all this being said, I just want to say rest in peace to Easy E, and I also want to thank the Most High for healing Dre of the brain aneurysm that he had in the beginning of 20. If you already have your own base, I mean, you screw their face up at me on some real shit, son, they don't want to be. I cock that, ain't that shit out the way. Before G-Unit, before Vitamin Water, before being a successful entrepreneur, Curtis Jackson was just the average kid born into poverty in South Jamaica, Queens. At the age of 12, he began selling drugs during the 80s crack epidemic. Infatuated with the street life, young Curtis would name himself after a street legend known as the original 50 Cent. Kelvin Martin received the name 50 Cent because he was known to rob anyone at any time, and it also didn't matter how much money they were carrying. If you only had two pennies, he'll take that up off you. His name also came from other characteristics he possessed as well. That being his luck in dice games and the fact that he was a small guy weighing only 120 pounds and standing at 5 feet 2 inches. The original 50 Cent would be murdered in 1987 and Curtis Jackson would still go through the same troubles as any youth. In the late 90s, Curtis would take on the name of the street legend and will now be known as 50 Cent. Also during this time, he would pursue his music career and would later go on to produce his debut album Power of the Dollar for Columbia Records. But the album wouldn't come out as days before it was supposed to be released, 50 Cent would get shot nine times, resulting in the album never being released. This also caused 50 Cent to be dropped from Columbia Records. As they speculated, the reason he was shot was because of a song that appeared on Power of the Dollar called Ghetto Quran. 50 said some lines on this track that were very concerning towards street legend Kenneth McGriff that may have led to him getting shot nine times and Jam Master J getting killed as Jam Master J took 50 under his wing. I used to idolize Pat. Hurt me to my heart to hear that nigga snitched on Pat. How you go out like that? Rumors in the hood was just for snitching. But before all this would happen, 50 would release the single for Power of the Dollar called How to Rob. And this would be the track that would put 50 in the limelight. Oh, the concept was 50 Cent name dropping famous people he'd rob. I must note that he did this jokingly in order to get reactions from the artists he was dissing. The track. A lot of people didn't remember, bro, but he, he dropped, uh, I think, Murder on there, too. Murder, I don't believe you, murder, fucking right and leave, that one. Yeah, that shit went off, too. It was cold to me. I ain't gonna lie. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I wasn't around in the 90s. Early, not in the early 90s, bro. I'm a 97 baby. Here we go.
Fact also pays homage to the original 50 Cent as he was known to rob anyone. 50 starts off the track paying homage to Pac and Big with the Mad Rapper informing listeners to not take the line serious. He also says that people can take it however they want, basically saying that they'll accept all the smoke. 50 then states that if his records don't sell, he's gonna rob and steal. Hey yo, the bottom line is, I'm a crook with a deal. If my record don't sell, I'm a rob and steal. He then name drops Bobby Brown, Whitney Houston, Brian and Knight, Keep Sweat, Harlem World, Old Dirty Bad. Bastard, Foxy Brown, Corrupt, yeah. Jay Z, Case, yeah, Trackmaster, Slip Rick, yeah. Stevie J, Big Pun, Master P, Silk the Shocker, Will Smith, Jada Pinkett, like Timberland, Missy, Joe, Jermaine Dupri, Brat, DMX, Tretch, DJ Clue, TQ, Raekwon, Ghostface Killer, Rizzo, Man, Sticky Fingers, Fred Rose Star, Cannabis, Heavy D, Juvenile, Blackstreet, R. Kelly, Boys to Men, Michael Bivens, Mike Tyson, Robin Givens, Mr. C, Buster Rhymes, and Kurt Franklin. Yeah, I know, it's a lot, and I'm pretty sure I missed somebody too. I also must point out this that man, the Mad yeah. Rapper continues to state that the disses aren't meant to be taken serious, but a handful of these celebs weren't fond of this track. This only meant that 50 achieved exactly what he said this ain't serious. <laughs> Being broke can't make you delirious when you rob and steal. He wanted, and that was to get reaction out of these already established names. The most notable response has to be when Jay Z responded in a friendly way at Summer Jam 1999. Jay would approach 50 and tell him that he loved this record. He also told 50 that he gotta also get him back. 50 had no idea Jay was about to do this in front of the Summer Jam crowd. I'm about dollars. Who the fuck is 50? 50 could do nothing but thank Jay-Z, as thousands of people in the crowd would now know who he was. Another notable response was from Mariah Carey, who was signed to the same label 50 Cent was signed to. There was an original line in How to Rob, where 50 disses Mariah and her ex-husband Tommy Mottola. The line went like this, I'll manhandle Mariah like a Get on the ground, you ain't with Tommy no more, who gon' protect you now? Mariah didn't approve of the lyric, and since she was a big artist on the label, she was able to get the line removed from the song. The line was later replaced with Mary J. Blige and her ex at the time, which was R&B singer and songwriter Case. I manhandle Case like dope, get on the ground, you ain't with Mary no more, where you getting chips from now? 50 would then get several more responses from the Wu-Tang Clan, Corrupt, Wyclef John, and even the late great Big Pun. To the city, said rapper, very friendly, get your nut off. Cause in real life, you all know I'll blow your motherfucking head off. Yeah. It's safe to say that 50's plan worked as he received a ton of reactions from highly established artists. And although Power of the Dollar was never officially released, he would go on to achieve a much greater status when he released his major debut album, Get Rich or Die Trying, in the year 2003. 50 can also thank the How to Rob Dish track for giving him that much needed career boost to begin his long lasting successful career. But it's kind of sad to say that this tactic doesn't really work that well in today's climate of hip hop. If a no name artist were to make a How to Rob in today's hip hop, they'll probably be classified as a clout chaser. But what casual sure. listeners of hip hop don't understand is that this was the foundation of hip hop. If you want to let it be known that you have skill, you would have to go at people that have already established themselves. Mm -hmm. If it yeah, wasn't for this up. tactic, 50 Cent probably wouldn't be where he's at today. But I must say that the lore of this track has- I ain't gonna lie to y'all. For those who don't know, man, I rap a little bit. Uh, most of my videos is on TikTok. <laughs> I, I don't know, I might drop some music every now and then, but I mean, well, if, if later on in life. But uh, this is what I got to say about this. Man, I used to watch the beef DVDs and, uh, and this rapper named KRS-One said, you got to be ready for anything. So he wrote a diss track for everybody in the rap game. He has a diss track for everybody. That's what I ended up doing. I was on a poetry team back in high school, bro. I had a disc record ready for anybody. If you was on my team, if I if I knew you from a different school and we was cool, I don't care. I wrote some disc tracks for you. Why? Because I was ready like that. Also, anybody in my little uh, poetry group uh, or uh, cypher club or whatever of the job for it, I wrote disc tracks for y'all too. Because I was ready for anything. I was ready for war. I still am stuck around as many okay. artists have made their own versions of it. Just recently an artist named Cupcake made her version of How to Rob and I must oh, admit yeah. she definitely bodied it and the track she was also it. very well received. I'ma run up on Amigo, shoot him like a free throw, nigga I'm so unbothered. Drop off that body in the jungle since he wanna be a cheater, forgive me little father. There just might be hope that this form of hip hop just might come back. <laughs>
leave the video the link down in the description below, man. I ain't gonna lie, he, he's one of my favorite YouTubers. I used to uh, watch him alongside, uh, you know, Corey X Kenshin, BHD, uh, Arm Dante, uh, Berlizzi, Dashy, all of them. Uh, and I, I still kind of do. Anytime any they drop videos, I, I go watch their video, of course. So, uh, do me a favor, man. Like, share, and subscribe. Be the best you that you can be. Don't let nobody hold you down because you can hold you down. I'm not deep. I'm going to try to be deep. But I'm deep. And deuces.